So yeah, so we're talking about Angular Promises, and um, I'm Cam. Uh, I am the CTO of a company called OpenCare. Uh, what we do is we help patients find doctors and book appointments online. So our stack is all in Node.js and Angular, so we do a lot of JavaScript day to day, um, but uh, hopefully be able to, to add some value with uh, some of this promise, promise stuff. Anyway, let's talk about promises. So what's a promise? So a promise is a tool to ma help manage the execution flow of asynchronous code. So it allows us to trigger behavior when an asynchronous piece of code completes in a richer way than with callbacks. So this may look familiar for people that have used Angular before. Uh, the interesting part that uses promises is not on line six, it's on line five. And, um, and basically, you know what I mean by execution flow of asynchronous code is that most of us have backgrounds in computer science which teaches uh, synchronous coding, right? You do this line, then you do the next line, then you do the next line. Um, JavaScript throws that all out the window and everything is asynchronous. So you kind of have to relearn how execution flow happens. And promises make that a lot easier because it provides an API structure in order to uh, clearly define what should happen in different cases of asynchronous execution flow. In other words, promises are like callbacks, but better. So let's talk about what a promise actually is. So the promise contract is a promise starts as unresolved and it can become resolved at any point in the future. So a promise has a state. It is either unresolved or it is resolved. And resolving a promise means that you can do one of two things. You're either going to fulfill it with a value when it's successful or you're going to reject it with a reason. Only one of those two things can happen. And it can only be resolved once. So you cannot resolve a promise multiple times and expect that whatever callback function or anything you set up there is gonna to continue to be executed. Once it's resolved, it's resolved. Once it's rejected, it's rejected. So let's get started and look at a quick example. So I'm just gonna show you functionality here. So this is a mini Angular app and there are a few things on here. There's a resolve promise button and a reject promise button. And right now the promise status is unresolved. So when I click resolve promise, that's really small, but it says <laughs> promise resolved with some resolved value. And then it says finally it's called. Okay, cool. And now the promise status is resolved. If I click on either of these things, nothing happens. So this is in line with what I was just saying about how prompts can only be resolved once. If I refresh this page, I can reject the promise, which says promise rejected with some error. And then finally it's called. Okay, cool. And now the promise is resolved. So from a you know, very simplistic level, this just kind of defines as an example the promise contract that I was just uh, explaining. So in Angular, we have something called the queue module. So this is Angular's implementation of promises. And it's effectively a trimmed down version of the queue library by Chris Kowal. Um, which is something that if you do a lot of Node, you may be familiar with. Um, you can also use it on front end for obvious reasons. Um, but it basically is, is very similar to that API. And there are three main parts of the queue module. The first is promise creation, so that's creating a new promise. Then there's the deferred API, and then there's the promise API. And I'll explain what each of these are. So in the queue module, um, this is how you create a promise. So what you create is actually something called a deferred. And a deferred object is created using the queue.defer method. And this deferred object handles what we're going to call the deferred API, which is what triggers the promise to be resolved. So we talked, you know, promise can be fulfilled on success or rejected on failure. The deferred is how you make that happen. And the deferred object also has a promise property on it. And this promise property handles the promise API. And so this is basically what happens when the promise is resolved. So if you want to tell a promise what to do when it's resolved, you're gonna do that on the promise. If you're going to actually change what a promise is, whether, like if you're gonna resolve it or reject it, you're doing that on the deferred. So some more details about the deferred API. 
So as I said, this is the API for triggering promise to be resolved by being fulfilled or rejected. So to fulfill it, you call defer.resolve and you pass it a value and this will successfully fulfill the promise. And it will also pass value as an argument to the success callback. So you can pass information to the success callback of that promise. You can also call defer.reject and pass it a reason. So you can pass to the error callback handler of the promise a reason, which can be in any of type. It can be an error object, it can be a string, however you want to do your error handling, that's what you can pass. Remember, a promise can only be resolved once. So if you call resolve many times, if you call reject many times, not going to help you. So the promise API itself is for handling promise resolution. So this is going to handle it whether it's successful or not. In order to handle a successful promise fulfillment, we will use something called promise.then. And in then you pass a function. And as I was just talking about how you can pass a value when you resolve a promise, that's going to get passed to the success callback in the then function. And you can also call promise.catch. And in here, this is where you define the error callback. So when you reject a promise, that reason is going to be passed to the error callback. The last thing is promise.finally. Mm -hmm. So finally is a function that is called after the promise is resolved, regardless of success or failure. If you're familiar with any other language that has try, catch, and finally, it's a very, very similar idea. So the finally callback accepts no arguments, and it is guaranteed that it will be called after either then or catch if they are exist if they exist in that promise chain. So let's look back at that example. So we probably remember what uh, what this thing actually does. Let's actually look at the implementation of this. So we may need to make this bigger as well. Is that good? Yeah. Perfect. Bigger. A little bigger. We're bigger? Yeah. Okay. Um, cool. So this is a really, really simple Angular app. So we define a controller up here where you'll see our, our two buttons, which on ng-click call resolve promise or reject promise. We also put our promise status. Then we define our actual code. So in our controller here, we're going to start promise status as unresolved. Then we're going to create the promise. Q.defer creates this deferred object. The next thing that we're going to do is we're going to define what happens when that promise is resolved. Because this is asynchronous, you have to define what's going to happen after it happens before it actually happens, right? So you're going on deferred.promise, we're going to call then, and we're going to show an alert saying the promise is resolved with the value that's passed in. Catch, which is going to uh, handle the rejection of the promise. And then finally, which is going to finally change the status of resolve. So, um, we're just binding these deferred.resolve and deferred.reject to each of these buttons effectively. And that gives us this nice little thing that we looked at initially. Very simple example, promise resolved with some resolve value, finally called, and then you can't do anything else similar for reject. So that's it. I'm done. Um, cool. So uh, that was... That's sort of the basic premise of promises. From that, you can derive all the other cool stuff that we're actually going to use, because that on its own is not, is not super interesting. So error handling in promises is, uh, is pretty cool, because it's not just about asynchronous uh, execution flow. It's also, promises also kind of function like a try catch. So it's not just a coincidence that there's that then cache finally structure that's very similar to try catch. Um, it's because if we throw an error inside of a then function and there is a catch function chained to it, the error will actually be caught and passed into that catch block. So that's kind of cool and that's something that you don't get with callbacks. And this is because then actually creates a new promise that wraps the callback function and then that promise is chained to the catch. So when you throw something inside of a then block, it is wrapped by another promise, which will then fail or be rejected and then go to the next catch block. So let's look at another example. So this example is kind of similar to our, uh, our first example, but 
the code's a little bit different. So this stuff up here is all the same. This stuff up here is all the same, except we've added this throw new error, uh-oh, inside of this then block. So if you remember, when we rejected this original promise with the reason, it was saying promise rejected with some error. So let's see what happens in this case. Hopefully we don't get this line. So if I resolve this promise, it says promise resolved with some resolved value, cool. Then we see promise rejected with error, uh-oh. And then we see finally called. So this is a simple example that illustrates the point that throwing an error inside of a then block will actually bubble it out into the next catch. Um, in this simple case that we see here, we're, uh, we're resolving the original promise with value and then we're returning value plus one. That will actually be wrapped in a promise and then used as the resolve value into this next then as a new value. And similarly catch, if an error happens in any of these promises in the chain, it will get passed down to catch. And we talked about that. So returning values from promises is kind of boring. What happens if we return another promise? We're kind of getting into promiseception here. So if we have a promise that instead of returning a value, we are returning some function that returns a promise and passing it value, that is going to be wrapped in a promise and then chained to that. So with me? So what's going to happen here is uh, this next then is going to be contingent on the resolution of this code here. So if, for example, this original promise is, uh, let's say, an API call or an HTTP request. When that response gets back, it's going to execute this. Let's say this is another HTTP request. This then isn't going to be called until this promise is resolved. If either of these throw errors, it gets bubbled down to the catch. So you can start to maybe see the power of what we can do with promises here. This allows us to do some pretty cool things. So let's take a look at another example here. So I've changed my HTML slightly. I've gotten rid of my reject promise because I don't care about rejecting it. And what I've done here is I'm using the angular timeout function, which uses promises. So this calling timeout and passing it angular nope, which is just an empty function, and passing it a timeout will return a promise that will resolve basically after two seconds. So we'll see first then call, the second then call, and then the finally call. So you guys can probably guess what we're expecting to see here, but when I click resolve promise, we see the first then called, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, second then called, then we wait a little bit more, and we get the final call. So that's really just to demonstrate the way that these promises are bubbling with each other. All right, so here's something cool. There is a tool on the Q module called Q.all. Q.all is an and-like function that resolves when all promises passed to it are resolved successfully. So I say it's and-like because if you take an old-fashioned AND operator, it's only going to be true when all of the things are true. And as soon as one of the things is false, it just stops what it's doing and it returns false. It's the exact same idea with q.all. So you can pass it an array of promises or an object hash where all the values are different promises. And what it'll do is it'll go and it'll wait for all of those promises. And once they've all finished, then it will pass, it, then it will go to the next call. And the cool thing there is it will take the results of all of those different promises and return them in an array to your then callback. <clears throat> so let's see an example of this at work. There we go. So I've changed my HTML a little bit. I still have my resolve promises button. I also have an ng repeat now, which is going to basically output the array promise output. Then, when I click my button, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to call q.all and I'm going to pass it four timeout promises. Now, each of these promises are going to do uh, a thing. When this is resolved, it's going to push 
onto this promise output a message. So keep in mind this is happening when that individual promise is resolved. And then it's going to return a value. These are kind of out of order. You can see promise one is going to take one seconds, promise two is going to take four seconds. So let's see what's actually happening here when we click resolve promises. So we're going to wait one second, two seconds, three seconds, and then we're actually not going to get four seconds, and I'll explain why in a sec. So what we're seeing, it makes sense in terms of the promises getting output in order, because that's the order that the promises are being resolved in. But what you'll see is that the then doesn't get called until all the promises are done resolving. And the values that each of those return are contained in an array, which you maybe can see up there just as ABCD. So the reason that that last promise didn't get output is because of the way that Q interacts with the scope, which I'm not going to get into because it's kind of complicated. But um, when I do that, you'll see that last thing pop up. That just So when I say it interacts with the scope, it has to do with basically the fact that Angular hasn't done its rendering of, hey, this is in the scope, let's put it in the DOM, by time that Q.all is triggered. So is that an alert that you popped up? Yeah. And so it froze the browser from continuing on? Sorry? It froze the browser from sort of continuing on? Yes. So, uh, yeah, that's that's what was doing it down here. So it's just outputting values there. If you did that in like a div, that promise would actually be like you wouldn't even notice. You wouldn't because notice. Because alert stops at this. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Really use alert, so I guess they don't. <laughs> Neither do I. Demonstration <laughs> purposes. Um, cool. Okay. So we've talked a lot about like a bunch of hypotheticals, but for actually using Angular in a real world app, let's talk about why promises are very valuable. So Angular resources use promises. Um, I don't know how much experience everybody in this room has with Angular, but in a resource you can pass it callbacks, or what you can do is you can do something more like this, where you call get, and then you take a promise property off of that, and then you start doing your promise chains. So, with an Angular resource, uh, responses that return in the 200s are basically going to resolve the promise successfully. So it's going to fulfill the promise. Otherwise, the promise is going to be rejected. So <clears throat> this makes this very, uh, very useful for handling basically whether or not a promise is successful and doing different things based on whether or not you're getting a 200 back. Error handling, basically. And because we know about chaining of promises, we can do cool things with promise resources. So if you think about you know, a hypothetical example where you might have a resource where you're adding a user like this, and you're calling save, which is going to do a post, and then once you do that, you want to update, let's say, your list of users. So you can do that using the promise chain. So we can go, we can save our user, and then we can get into, uh, we can, when that's done, our user resource is going to update, and then when that's done, we can update our scope. If any error happens in this, we can catch the error here and output it to the user, so you can have one place where you can define, hey, adding a user failed, something like that. All right, example five, the best example. So this is, this is a more of a real, real example, I would say. So what I've set up here is uh, basically a Angular app that has two views in it, and that's with an ng view, and I've actually just inserted my views at the bottom. Um, this is a cool thing that you can do. I don't know how many people leverage this, but if you define a script tag with text ng template, and you pass and you name it with an ID, um, it will actually load that into Angular's template cache and it will check there first before it tries to do a get request to your server. So in my uh, root provider, I've just defined these template URLs, but it's actually never gonna do an HTTP request because it's gonna have loaded these already in there and it's gonna get those. So that's just a cool little aside that you can do in Angular. But anyway, so we have a we have a home page which is just a link that takes us to the user page, and then we have a user page which is a very very simple form that has name, gender, age, and appropriate text fields. 
So a few other things going on in this. So I have my controller, and in my controller, when it loads, I'm going to call my user resource, which is going to uh, get a user based on the parameter uh, in the URL. And then when that response comes back successfully, I'm going to take the result of that and put it on my scope. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to find a very simple <coughs> root provider where I define my user controller with my little user form there. And then I have an empty controller that's going to be the home. The last thing I did is I created a fake user resource. So what I did is I basically just faked out the API, but using timeouts, um, I created a way just of sending back a response and setting a timeout. And the reason for this is because uh, I want to demonstrate something that is more noticeable with longer HTTP requests which happens in real life. So let's take a look at what this actually does. So I'm going to go to the user page. It's going to load up. Oh, and then my data loads. So there's a second delay there, which happens, you know, depending on how fast your API server is or whatever API you're hitting. Um, might be a second, might be less, but in real life this does happen. And it's kind of a crappy user experience for a user to change their views and then get to a page and then have all the data load. So it's less noticeable here because the form data there is there. But if I'm visiting, let's assume that this is like my account page and you know I want to be able to update my name and all that kind of stuff. And I get there and for the first you know half a second or a second there's no data and then it pops in. It's kind of weird and it's a little bit jarring to a user because they're not used to seeing stuff like that. They're used to seeing a page load with all their data. So what can we do about this? Well, there is a very, very cool thing that Angular provides. And it's called Resolve. So what I can do here is I can define a function inside my root provider definition. And what this function will do it resolve whatever promise is returned from this. And it won't actually load the view until that promise is resolved. So what I can do here, something like this. So the reason I'm, so just to add to that, so it'll actually, it'll wait for that to resolve. And when it's about to load this root, it's going to call this, wait for that to resolve, and then take whatever would be passed to the then function and actually inject it into my controller with this variable name. So because I have user defined there, I can get user passed in here and I can say something like this. And then if I reload my example here, and I go to the user page, we wait for a sec, and then it loads up. So this is pretty cool, because now we're not going to show a user a page until the required dependencies, which could be from asynchronous code, has been injected into that control. So what else can we do with this? Well. Let's assume that actually getting this user resource, what if, what if this user doesn't have access to this resource? Let's say they don't have permissions. Let's say they're not a super user or they're trying to access a user that, is, uh, that doesn't belong to them. So you know, in, in a traditional app, you would get a 403, you'd get some page thing, you don't have access to do this. Uh, but in Angular, the paradigm changes. So, as we know, if it's not a 200 that comes back, it's going to be a rejected promise. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say q dot reject q dot reject is a short form for saying, hey, create me a new promise and then immediately reject it. So this 
user is now going to return a, a rejected promise right off the bat. So now if I go back here, reload my page, nothing happens. It changed my location, but it didn't actually change my view. And that's because Angular, if it gets any of those promises rejected, it won't finish the root change. So remember q.all? That's what it's using. So if any of the promises aren't resolved, it will just not make that root change. And okay, it kind of sucks because you're just not changing the root. Well, what are you gonna do to the user? So let's add something else. Just cowboy programming here. There's this event that happens on the root scope when there's a root change error. And it's called root change error. And what this does is it allows you to define a callback when there's a root change error. I don't buy Sublime, sorry. Um, you monster. <laughs> um, so if we go back to our cool little app here, and click go to user page, well, our promise got rejected, and so that triggered the error handle. So that's going to show this alert that says this should probably call a 403 page or something. So now we have the ability to intercept these page changes in a real Angular app and do things with them, like send, the, send users to a 403 page or a 404 page. Uh, so we can start to see that we can do some pretty cool stuff here because not only can we inject data into a controller as we're moving to it, but we can also say, do or don't change to this controller based on something. So if I wanted to add, let's say that I have my user back in here. I could do something else and say something like permission and inside this function I can do some sort of if statement, user has permission, and I can check the ID or whatever page they're trying to go to, and I can either reject or resolve the response, or reject or resolve the promise based on that. So I can do a, let's say I can do a call to an endpoint, check permissions, or I can cache that inside the app, I can check permissions against there, and I can say immediately, hey, actually you're forbidden from accessing this page, so don't do it. This is something that is really powerful and if you ever start dealing with an Angular app that has users that are logged in and need to check whether they're logged in, all that kind of stuff, you're gonna wanna use this. So just to recap what we just talked about with controller dependency injection. We resolve all promises defined in the root provider configuration and we inject them into the controller. The root change will not complete until all the promises are resolved successfully using q.all. If one or more of the promises are rejected, the root will not change and the root change error event, event will be triggered. I do want to note that there is also a root change success message. So if you want to do something cool with, let's say a loading icon in the top right corner, um, you can put an event on root change start and then you can put an event on root change error and root change success that's going to turn off the loading icon so you can you can intercept a bunch of events there and as we talked about resource promises will resolve successfully with any type of 200 HP code that's returning the response otherwise the promise will be rejected so this is extremely useful for loading page data permission checking and login status checking so I want to recap everything we talked about so promises are a great way of handling asynchronous code execution. 
Promises can be resolved successfully or rejected. Error handling is much nicer using catch, especially for chaining and bubbling of errors. We don't have pyramids of doom, which I think exists less in Angular than they do in something like Node, but uh, you just don't have callbacks on callbacks and callbacks. And Q.all allows us to do many asynchronous operations in parallel and do something when they're complete. And resolving dependency injections can be very useful for loading page data, permission checking, and login status check. The last thing is that promises are not just available in Angular. Uh, there are many libraries, such as the Q library, which can be used in JavaScript or Node. So I'm Cam, and I'm the CTO at OpenCare. And that's it. So ask me questions. <laughs>